Tear gas, rubber bullets and angry slogans have been flying in Egypt's Tahrir Square as police and protesters clash for a third day. Uh, the country's officials claim at least 35 people have now been killed in the largest demonstration uh, since February's uprising that ousted dictator Hosni Mubarak. Now we can get some more details on this and uh, speak to independent online journalist uh, James Corbett uh, standing by for us live. Uh, thanks for coming on the program today. Uh, with elections just around the corner, why did people decide to resort to protest and violence when they could have just cast their votes? Well, one would think so if, if that was really the way that this was going to play out. But of course, uh, what we have here is really the, the predictable result of a revolution that failed to do what it really set out to do without, uh, without realizing it. And I think that is to actually fundamentally alter the, the power structure as, as it's going on in, in, this, in the country. I mean, really what, what ultimately happened was throwing out a, a figurehead instead of the actual power structure itself, which has been for many years and continues to be the, the military dictatorship that Egypt really is at base. So um, so I, I think the, the illusion of democracy is just that until the, the underlying power structure that's going on there can be ousted, I don't think anything really has changed. Okay, so, so they got rid of the leader. They got rid of Hosni Mubarak. Um, as you're suggesting there, perhaps it's just a reshuffling of the same furniture there in the, in, in the ruling party. Uh, but since Mubarak was ousted nine months ago, uh, crime rates are higher, violence is on the rise, uh, and protesters demand that mili military rulers transfer power to a civilian government. But do you really think at this point, with the violence and crimes on the rise, are the people actually ready to take the power into their own hands? Well, uh, if not now, then when, I suppose, would be the question. Um, there's always going to be a question whenever there's a transfer of, of power in a society from uh, when it devolves from a highly organized, if uh, brutally oppressive state into a, a more decentralized and more hopefully democratic state, that uh, there will be that moment where, uh, where a, a lot of the institutions that people have taken for granted do come into question. But I think it's a question of the, the Egyptian society being able to step up to the plate and handle that rather than, um, than, than uh, assuming that uh, that there is going to fail and thus that uh, the entire revolution is, is in vain. Um, I, I think ultimately that, that, that falls into the type of uh, power politics that get played in, in situations like this where you have the, uh, the often the, the Western interventionist uh, type uh, policies that, that uh, assume that people can't quite handle democracy yet and thus they need to be ruled over by a dictator of some sort. So, um, so I think that, that just plays into the hands of the, the, the people who are uh, watching this from behind the scenes and wondering how they're going to fit into the new geopolitical paradigm rather than what's in the interests of the people themselves. Well, it's interesting how you bring uh, the, the issue of the West into this picture. We're looking at uh, the latest report from the Central Morgue in Cairo. It says that uh, 35 dead at this point. Uh, troops over the weekend launched a major assault to clear the protesters from the infamous Tahrir Square. I mean, are, are we looking at the beginning of another revolution? And if so, as perhaps you alluded to moments ago, will NATO be tempted to get involved? Well, I suppose that's always a possibility, and certainly increasingly so in this uh, in this new paradigm that we have post uh, Libya. But I, I, I wouldn't posit that this is a new revolution so much as a continuation of the revolution. I think that the revolutionary fervor that was uh, that was there in the earlier part of this year was was just uh, um, it, it was spent, but not completely spent, and it, it didn't really accomplish the task that it had set out for itself. And I think uh, a lot of the the uh, unfortunately the, the the neoliberal warmongers on the left side of American politics that now play into this because uh, their president is in power and is thus the one behind this foreign policy. Policy, um, did a premature celebration about uh, about the entire revolution itself and posited that this that the overthrowing of Mubarak was really the liberation of the Egyptian people. But of course, in any situation like this, there's an underlying power structure that props up these types of dictators. And until that underlying problem is really taken care of, there's really no possibility for a revolution to be successful. So, well, as, so I mean, I think I'm, this so I'm is sorry to interrupt be... you, but as you say, you know, the, the West was celebrating Mubarak being ousted in February, now nine months ago. Uh, but, but currently, uh, um, the third day of unrest, uh, violence, 35 dead at least. Uh, so far, not a word yet from the West condemning civilian deaths, uh, much like they've, they've been doing in Syria, much like what they did in Libya uh, when it came to introducing UN Resolution 1973. Uh, why why the, uh, the double standards here uh, when, when it comes to what's going on? Well, that's a, that's a very good point. That's a very good question, because I think that points out the hypocrisy that's been there all along. I don't think the West was really... I, I, you, you notice that Mubarak was was a favored guest of the White House and, and all of that um, right up until the time of the, this type of um, the uprising in Egypt. So I think really what's happening here is that the, the West saw an opportune time to leap off of the Mubarak bandwagon and hoping that the, the power structure would continue in Egypt that would maintain the status quo in the region. But since that destabilization looks like it's going to go even further, 
where I think that the um, people in the powers in Western interventionist countries are now are now wondering what how far this will go and whether it can go perhaps too far for for their comfort because obviously we've already seen what the destabilization is doing for example between the relations between Egypt and Israel which have been uh, fast friends for many years under Mubarak but that uh, relationship is coming into question now. Yeah. As, as, as we know the protesters want the presidential vote to uh, take place after parliamentary elections uh, they, they begin on the 28th of November uh, they'll be staggered out over the next three months uh, do you think do, do, do you see them having a positive effect here otherwise what is the end game uh, the end game, well, that's a very good question. I think ultimately we're going to have to wait and see, and I know that's an, uh, not a particularly satisfying answer, but I think um, on both sides of, of this uh, right now, it's a, it's a very delicate time, and I think it could go either way at the moment, but I think it's certainly the, the momentum must be on the sides of the revolutionary crowd at this point. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what type of crackdown would even be possible or viable by the, the military at this point, so um, I'm really not sure what the, what the end game would be for... Uh, for the military other than to preserve its dictatorship in any way it can. So I think it has to lay off the crowds at some point here um, or risk some sort of NATO intervention, which, as we say, is now on the table in this post-Libya paradigm. All right, uh, James Corbett there, an independent online journalist, alive for us in Osaka. Many thanks indeed. Thank you.